A couple of weeks ago now, I was a panellist for GB News' own Mark Dolan. Uh, he had, as one of his guests, a church minister from Glasgow, the Reverend Dr William Phillip. I, I make no bones about it. I listened to William speak about the role of the church and faith leaders, leaders in general, in times of crisis, specifically the lockdown, and I was blown away. I've been in touch with uh, the Reverend since then, and I'm delighted to say he has agreed to be my guest tonight. In these troubled and troubling days, I know that uncounted numbers of people are struggling in all manner of ways. People are scared, lonely, feeling hopeless and helpless. I listened to the Reverend speak on that show, and by the end of his interview, I simply felt better for having listened to him. And for that reason, above all, I wanted to have him on my show tonight as my Great Britain. And uh, William joins me now. He's the senior minister at the Tron Church in Glasgow. Are you there, William? I know you're there. I'm reaching out for you, William. Where are you? I'm here. Good evening. There you are, <laughs> William. Hello. Um, it's lovely. It's lovely to see you. Uh, you know, I'm, I know we're, we're, we're making plans to, to to meet you and I at some point in the in the near future and have a cup of coffee and a chat. But this is the is the virtual next best thing. Uh, to me, uh, these have been days and weeks and months, years now, like no others that I've known. Uh, do you feel the same way? I mean, I do. It, it's probably been the most strange and difficult period on a, on a national scale uh, in my lifetime that I can remember. But of course, you know, I, I think probably I'm about the same age as you, Neil. Our, our lifetime has been a, a hugely privileged one. Uh, I've not lived through a war and have to fight in a war like my father's generation did. The last 50 years have been very peaceful, prosperous. And um, I think in a way, perhaps this, this crisis has revealed a lot about our nation, not all that good, uh, about our priorities, um, about our people. And uh, so it's been, a, it's been a very revealing time. It's, it's interesting, isn't it, when you say that, as though, almost as though times of peace and plenty and, and relative security, while it sounds and is and feels ideal, uh, do you think it has uh, it eroded something else and weakened us in certain ways, so that, ironically, you know, sustained periods of, 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 of peace and security. We have to be careful even then for other reasons. I mean, I think that may be true. You know, there was that famous book back in the 1980s by Neil Postman. Um, what was it called? Um, Entertaining Ourselves to Death, Amusing Ourselves to Death. And uh, talking about the trivialization of, of our culture, and I suppose now we've moved into a culture of consuming ourselves to death. And um, yeah, I think I think we've we've not had to think about the big important questions of of life and society, perhaps in a way that previous generations have, and it's it's uh, it's been to our detriment. And maybe a crisis like this is a wake up call to do that. You, you've taken what I and I'm sure many others would call a, a brave and a, a principled stand about lockdown and other restrictions and the impact that they had on the people that, that you were close with. Um, wh why, for those who didn't, who didn't hear what you had to say uh, on Mark Dolan's show, why did you feel that it was necessary to get up on your feet and say what you did at the time? Um, well, I suppose if Christian leaders don't give a lead, especially on moral matters, who is going to give us a lead? Um, because politicians are not leaders, are they? They're followers. They're followers of the votes. And many of those around politicians, um, they're following the money and they won't bite the hand that feeds them. And so in many ways, popularity and patronage it rules today. And that, and that goes against real leadership, and especially moral leadership. Um, the calling to Christian leadership isn't to popularity, it's to witness, it's to speaking the truth, it's to doing that in season and out of season and suffering for it if, if necessary. In fact, the very word witness means martyr in the Greek because truth is very rarely popular with the, with the powers that be. That's why Jesus said, woe to you when all speak well of you, um, because that's what their fathers did of the false prophets. So uh, I and many other, not just me, many Christian leaders um, have 
spoken out in matters to do with lockdown. Most recently, and very particularly um, in opposing vaccine passports, because we think that's something that's very dangerous and detrimental to society. I mean, it's quite impossible uh, theologically for the church to shut people out on the basis of uh, not having a health passport. But it's, it's, in a wider way, it's, it's damaging, it's divisive uh, to society. It, healthism, uh, some sort of health apartheid, is, 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 is as ugly and horrible as any other ism, racism, or any other kind of apartheid. And, um, and all of that, you know, when it's completely illogical and irrelevant medically, because whether you have the vaccine or haven't got the vaccine doesn't make you any safer or, or more dangerous to anybody else. Both can catch the virus, both can spread it and so on. But, but the damage will be done, even though the benefit will not be gained. And so it's important for the health and the well-being of our nation, which we care for. And um, that, that, that's why we've, we've stood up on that particular issue, just as we did when um, uh, gathering for communal worship was, was criminalized. Uh, that also was something very damaging and, uh, and, uh, and dangerous to society. And um, we have a duty to God and to the nation to speak out about these things, whether it makes us popular or not. I, 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 so, I, so, I so agree with what you're saying, but so much of the focus has been on the virus and nothing else. So, so what has been, you've, you've, you've touched on it, you've, you've spoken about it there, but what, what are we fundamentally neglecting at, at the same time through this absolute focus on one problem and, and, and one set of answers to that problem? What are we missing and forgetting and, and allowing to dwindle? I think we're missing what, what is surely one of the great existential questions of our age, which is you know, the question, what does it mean to be human? What is life and what does really promote human flourishing? Um, and, you know, the, the Bible and Christian teaching tells us that human beings are made in the image of God. We are created as spiritual beings for worship in relation to God. We're created as relational beings in community in relation to our fellows. We're created as, uh, as moral beings for responsibility, for stewardship and lordship over, uh, over creation. Um, and lockdown has dehumanized people because it removes that personal responsibility, that community, and also it removed worship. That's why it's been so very damaging, never mind all of the other multiple harms economically and, and to health and so on because of, of shutting down health services. Um, and of course, that's the more terrible because we know now there's an enormous weight of evidence that tells us that it hasn't even helped managing uh, the pandemic. But, but this key question, what does it really mean to be human? What is our place in the world? Um, that's something I think that people are very, very confused about uh, in our world today. People don't know who they are, what they are, what, where their identities find. Uh, we see that confusion increasingly in, in, in sexual confusion, gender confusion, uh, the whole approach to COVID. Uh, this whole issue of sort of, of, of transhumanism and, and the relationship between artificial intelligence and, and, and humanity. And we're, we're in real danger, I think, of losing a fulsome understanding of, of human life and what it really means uh, to be human. And the biblical uh, view of humanity is much, much richer than that. No, absolutely. And are you, I mean, on the strength of what you've had to say, are you, are you receiving contact from people that, that, that previously hadn't looked to, to the church or, or to a faith leader? You know, are you, are you, are you, are you, seeing, yeah. are you seeing people return to you or, or seeking, out, seeking help from you who might otherwise not have sought that help there? Yeah, I've been astonished that um, the unsolicited uh, contacts that I've had from all over the place and from all over the country, all over the world, actually, often um, people who've been formerly atheists, but thinking people, and they're trying to make sense of, uh, of what's going on. They're recognizing uh, the reality of, 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 of what they're sometimes calling darkness or wickedness or, or, or evil, and they're, and they're seeking an explanation for that. And they're, I think, seeing that... Uh, it's the Christian worldview that actually uh, explains the world. It chimes with the reality that they, uh, that they are seeing. And so they're seeking and, uh, it, it, I'm, uh, and many others trying to, to, to give answers. Of course, <laughs> understanding and seeing these things alone isn't, isn't enough. It, it's one thing to see that evil is out there. 
it's another thing and it's a big challenge to see actually that evil is in here <laughs> and that it's our own human hearts that are a, a part of the problem. There was that famous story, wasn't there, um, years back when the, uh, the Times posed the question, uh, asking people to write in and say, what's wrong with the world? And uh, G.K. Chesterton apparently wrote in and just said two words, I am yours sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. And that's the heart of the issue. <laughs> And, um, and that's what we're seeking to explore with people. That's the rub, of course, because the call of the Christian gospel is not just to, to understand these things. It's a, it's a command to repent, uh, to turn away, to, to, to recognize that everything we've thought and done before has been wrong. And, and it's very, very hard to do that, isn't it? That's why we find our governments finding it very, very hard to admit mistakes or or, or change tack or anything like that. Repentance, turning, <laughs> is the hardest thing for the human being to do. Yeah, I'm minded by what you're saying of, of, of Solzhenitsyn's great truth about um, the line between good and evil, you know, not being between political parties and not running through countries or between populations, but running through every human heart. And that, yeah. and that a fundamental part of understanding what it is to be human and alive is knowing that the monster is not that guy over there, but potentially it's me. <laughs> and if you're, if you're not mindful of that, then you're the most dangerous person in the room. That's right. I mean, uh, there's a, somebody was speaking at our church uh, a few years ago, and they said, I'm going to take the very middle verse of the Bible. Now, I don't know if this really is the middle verse of the Bible or not, but that's for Psalm 118, verse 8. And it says, it's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. And that actually is the central message uh, of the Bible. It tells you that man is a failure and cannot be trusted. Put not your faith in princes, uh, in the Son of Man, in whom there is no salvation. Well, we've discovered that, haven't we, uh, in spades over this last year. The Afghan people, sadly, tragically, have discovered that in the last weeks, haven't they? Put not your trust in presidents or prime ministers. Man is untrustworthy. Man is a failure. But take refuge in God. And there is hope because he is trustworthy and he is a savior. And so that's the message that, that our nation needs to hear in the middle of a crisis. And that's the message perhaps that hasn't been heard because the church has been too silent or has been closed down and has been silenced. But that's a message, I think, of real hope when people are despairing of their governments. William, it's great to hear. I, I just love to, it's so seldom that the, the, the kind of, um, the thoughts that you're expressing, I, I, I don't hear them often enough. Uh, and I could, I could talk to you at great length and I'll hope that we'll follow through and we'll, you and I will meet up and, and have a longer conversation. But thanks again, uh, you've, you've, you've helped me a great deal and I will look forward to meeting up with you another time. Thank you, Reverend William Philip. It's, it, it fascinates me to, to be reminded that we don't, we, we, we don't make room very often for the, sort of transcend the transcendent, do we? You know, we don't think about you know, dealing with dealing with a virus. We don't, you know, we don't we don't think about uh, that the, that there are other things to bear in mind and to pay attention to other than just the practical. Yeah, and it's just wonderful listening to a conversation like that, uh, Neil, because you won't hear that on any of the other mainstream uh, news channels. And I think it's a moment, isn't it, to reflect? Uh, you know, whether you're a person of faith. Uh, in terms of your beliefs in organised religion or not, you know, there's no getting away from the fact that our whole civilization, especially Western civilization, is built on a Romano-Greco, you know, Christian uh, Judaism uh, culture, and we forget that at our peril. Yeah. You know, I know in a secular society we want to. You know, famously, Tony Blair didn't do the God thing, or Alistair Campbell told him not to. Yeah. But we've got to remember where these important values really do come from. Well, I do wonder if it is that loss of uh, loss of religion in this country that may have led to some of this madness that you were talking about at the start of the show. Why are we so obsessed with COVID? Is it because we don't have a higher being to look to? Is it because we don't have religion? as part of our lives anymore, or a lot of us don't. Or, or is that why we're so obsessed with identity politics and finding meaning in that way? The new and it's not, yes, being, exactly. it's not being open to the conversation, at least. You yeah. know, we, we block ourselves off from it.